So, there's a war on in Ukraine. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe, like me and millions of other people, you're even mad about it and looking for a way to do something to help. If so, and you haven't already, maybe you should check out the itch.io bundle for Ukraine, which has raised almost $6 million in relief funds for the country. In what might be one of the nicest trends of the 2020s, whenever there is a public crisis that pretty much everyone agrees sucks. The good indie developers at HauntIch.io all combine their powers to create a mega bundle of hundreds of games, all for the low, low price of $10. For a pittance of time and money, you can do a little bit to help a country that truly needs it, and you get an absurd number of games in return. So if you haven't bought the bundle yet, the link's in the description, go buy it, you've still got 24 hours, really this takes almost no effort and is like the absolute bare minimum you could possibly do to help out the people of Ukraine. And then after you've bought it, come back here and play these games, because a lot of them are awesome. And if you already have the bundle, then hey, here's a list of games you already own and should be playing. There's a lot to cover here, but first, a couple disclaimers. One, these are only quick looks. I didn't have the time to finish most of these games, I only played them for like two or three hours each. Two, even just doing quick looks, I barely got to play like a third of the games I wanted to. This is in no way an exhaustive list of everything interesting in this bundle. And three, we're dispensing with the usual style, and we're just gonna hit game after game after game. Let's go. Zero Ranger may very well be the single coolest shmup I have ever played. It's got a really striking two-color palette and some fantastic pixel art that make every single frame screenshotable, but even beyond that, this game goes all out on the rule of cool. It escalates and escalates and never looks back. Before you're even halfway through the game, you're duking it out with entire fleets of flagships, dueling repeated mini-bosses one after another, and facing dudes that don't even need a spaceship to kick your ass. And that's just the third level! This game is just so cool! I'm sorry, what? How does it play? Uh, honestly, pretty good. It ramps up just as fast mechanically as it does narratively, but it's still manageable enough even for a casual schmuck like me. It has a lot of cool boss fights, but the levels in between aren't any slouch either, with plenty of cool designs amongst the rank-and-file enemies and interesting curveballs thrown by the level design itself. But my favorite part is how the game has a sort of sliding difficulty. If you're doing particularly well and wipe a screen of enemies early, Zero Ranger will spawn in extra ones worth bonus points, which is an ingenious little way of fluidly challenging an overperforming player without feeling like like it's punishing them. Overall, this game's an absolute must-play. Crosscode's a much bigger game than what I usually cover. A big ol' real-time action JRPG. There's way more going on here mechanically than I expected, too, with a controller scheme that packs an astonishing number of different abilities onto very few buttons. It's a little complicated and fiddly to get used to, but once you get the hang of it, the sheer number of tactical options you have available at any given time makes Crosscode's combat extremely fun to play around with. And it's got this little sphere grid upgrade system that's actually really nice. It's packed with interesting abilities you can learn, but also pretty flexible, letting you shift points around almost at will so you can try out everything at least once. Crosscode also has some fantastic pixel art, with character art being a particular highlight. The main character is mostly mute for plot reasons, so the game makes up for it with a ton of lovingly animated expressions, way more than the norm in this sort of game. Which, speaking of, Crosscode's got a pretty interesting narrative so far, though I've only played like a quarter of it, and a lot of that comes down to the charm of the main character, Leia. The setup has everybody playing through a fictional MMO, but as a character who only seems to exist inside of the game, it's basically just real life for you. It's a plot straight out of a .hack anime, but it's much more lighthearted and not nearly as philosophically off the rails. And like everything else in the game, there's a lot to love about it. Gambari Super Strikers is basically an attempt to turn a soccer anime into a turn-based tactics game. Once you get a game or two in, Gambare really starts clicking with super-powered characters you have to strategize around, special abilities you can give your characters through a gear system, and a pretty light rule set that's easy to grasp and feels immensely satisfying when you daisy-chain the ball across the entire field in a single turn to score a goal. It's also got a bit of the Blood Bowl feel, with a lot of its moves being based on dice rolls and almost never a sure bet, but it's not nearly as punishing, only ending your turn if you lose the ball instead of at the slightest mistake. Gambare is a little rough around the edges with some pretty cumbersome UI, and it's desperately begging for a bigger budget to better capture that high-octane feel of a shonen anime. Try as it might, these animations just don't quite capture that same hype feeling. Definitely don't go into this expecting the Captain Tsubasa game, but it's still fun and satisfying. Nauticrawl puts you in control of a submersible Rube Goldberg machine. You're in this cockpit, there are like 30 buttons, good luck figuring out what they all do. 
This is not a crawl's primary selling point, but in truth, the machine's only complicated enough to stymie you for a few minutes, and if some detail does make it past you, the game's usually kind enough to tell you what went wrong so you don't do it again. What unfolds once you're past the initial learning curve and have figured out how to walk straight is a procedurally generated narrative-heavy roguelike where you're trying to escape a highly stratified society on a toxic, radiated ocean planet. It's got great atmosphere, the sense of danger and paranoia is ever-present even once you've come to grips with the controls, and while there might not be an overabundance of dialogue, how exactly you escape is a mystery you have to untangle yourself by learning all about the society you're escaping from. Both narratively and mechanically, it's a fun game to explore. Wand Wars is basically a top-down lethal game. It's an arcade multiplayer couch game that's basically tennis, but your goal is to spike the ball directly into your opponent's face. And just like Lethal League, it's got some really great game feel and has a low skill floor but high ceiling. But where Wand Wars really starts to tick is with its many, many alternate game modes. There are some insanely fun alternate modes here, particularly one where you're not fighting to hit each other, but to knock the ball into a goal. And even if you don't have a bunch of friends to conveniently play against, Wand Wars has an extremely satisfying single-player campaign that adds a bunch of insane bullet hell bosses on top of everything else. I got way more out of this game than I ever could have hoped for, and it's one of my favorites on this list. Clang 2 is an action rhythm game one could describe as the world's longest quick time event. Like any other rhythm game, you hit the buttons in time with the music to win, but it's with the added goal of playing out a little action scene as your character fights big cyber bosses, dodging lasers with a flick of your mouse and then smacking back with a flurry of time button presses. In gameplay, it's closest to Osu, but these two games are going for completely different experiences. Clang is much more story-oriented, complete with extended breaks for banter and little mid-song cutscenes, telling the story of a fallen, vaguely Tron-esque society as the titular Clang goes rampaging through its bones on a revenge quest. I'll be honest. Clang 2 is far from my favorite rhythm game. It's not even my favorite plot-driven one. Its one-size-fits-all difficulty means it takes a while to ramp up and get fun to play. There are all kinds of little technical slip-ups like a moving camera and awkward UI elements that can make parsing what you're supposed to do a little difficult, and most damningly, most of its song lists didn't really land with me. But aside from those UI hiccups, those issues all come down to personal taste, and I think it's a perfectly respectable entry to the genre that stands out from its peers by trying to do something different. You may very well like Chill Trance more than I do, and if you do, hey, you already own it, you might as well give it a look. 2064 Read Only Memories is a cyberpunk point-and-click detective game. The entire game revolves around this little fella, Turing, who shows up at your door after his creator goes missing and asks you to engage in a little private detective work to track him down. Turing dominates the early parts of this game, and whether it hooks you or not mostly hinges on how much you like him. So I'm happy to report that he's a pretty lovable little scamp, backed by both fantastic writing and full voice acting that immediately endear him and realistically capture all the million ways a computer, even a fully thinking one, would view the world differently from a person. Outside of the writing, there's not too much to say here. It's a pretty straightforward point click titled just like they've been making them for decades. The pixel art's pretty nice and there's the occasional mechanical flourish when you access a computer and get a little more interactivity, but mostly come to this one for the plot. Overall though, even though I've barely gotten into it, I'm already having a ton of fun with this one. Fans of Jet Set Radio rejoice! Butterflies attempts to capture the exact same experience with a little less of a budget. The result is a little rough around the edges, but the core is all there. Butterflies has two episodes out, both of which are basically their own little open world level to run around in, tag walls with graffiti, and do sick tricks off of rooftops. Tricks are pretty simple, but the actual navigation system is surprisingly complex, letting you drift, chain grinds together, and even just flip around and start skating backwards. The star of the show, however, is the map itself, an extremely vertical multi-tier maze with downhill turnpikes to give a satisfying rush of momentum, and narrow alleys with low rooftops to test your more technical skills. If you've been excitedly waiting for Bomb Rush Cyberfunk to bring this style of game back, Butterflies might hold you over until it comes out. Long Gone Days is a JRPG set in a modern-day war all about child soldiers that desert their mercenary unit the moment they realize they're fighting a petty personal war and not as the forces of justice their country's propaganda likes to puff them up as. Whew, talk about topical. Unfortunately, I've seen these tropes play out too many times to be impressed by Long Gone Day's narrative, which is mostly just a greatest hits tour of common wartime story themes, but what impressed me a little bit more were the game's visuals and its gameplay. It takes the usual turn-based JRPG combat and adds all kinds of little tweaks, like being able to target individual body parts and turning your mana bar into morale, something that not only shifts with the story beats, but also affects your stats. The latter in particular is a pretty ingenious little twist to mechanically put you in the character's shoes, as when they're feeling desperate and depressed, the game also gets harder for you. This one's still in early access, but keep an eye on it. 
Lucifer Within Us is an isometric detective game with a few pretty nifty twists. Its big hook is its cross-examination system, which has different suspects giving their testimonies while the game plays out the described events in real time, then lets you directly compare each person's version of events. In classic detective fashion, you point out a detail that contradicts someone's testimony, they tell you that you're very perceptive, and then they do a bunch of backpedaling to amend their timeline. And so the game more or less becomes an exercise in hunting for needles and haystacks, where between all the different testimonies, the random insights you get into characters' personalities, and the small notes about who can verify what, you're bombarded with a massive wall of information you have to start slowly deciphering. But if the gameplay won't sell you, the aesthetic might. You're not just any run-of-the-mill detective, but a full-on capital I Inquisitor in a sci-fi, heavily religious society. Between the themes and the aesthetic trappings, you might as well be one of those Warhammer 40k Inquisitors with the serial numbers filed off. The game's not perfect and does suffer from the classic Phoenix Wright problem where even if you know exactly what's going on, you still need to figure out what the exact piece of evidence presented at the exact right moment will make the game realize that fact. But those occasional hiccups aside, Lucifer Within Us presents some fun little brain teasers. Bard Harder is a quick and breezy visual novel about playing the D&D trope of the bard that will flirt with anything to its ultimate extreme. The healer is down, the rogue's in a cage, and you're alone, facing the BBEG with only your wits and a plus six charisma bonus to fend them off. Can you crack the would-be world-ending tyrant's heart of ice, or will you die horribly as your flirtations fall on deaf ears? If you haven't already realized, Bard Harder is a farcical romp celebrating the truly absurd nonsense that can sometimes go down during a tabletop game. That joke about anything being possible with a nat 20 writ out into an hour-long video game. And surprisingly, it actually sustains the joke for its full runtime. It clearly loves the medium it's representing, and even goes so far as to include not just the tabletop characters' lives, but also those of the players around the table. For a quick hour of your time, it's fun, light, and charming. Whew! So alright, that was enough recommendations to keep you all busy for a few months, but honestly, we're only scratching the surface here. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more stuff like it, pop on over to the Patreon. Every dollar over there helps keep the channel just a little more stable and ensures that I can keep doing that sweet, sweet content into perpetuity. But otherwise, I hope you all enjoyed hearing about some super cool games, and I'll see you all next time.